God, that the Holy Spirit, if He's here to reveal to us the deep things of God, it speaks to us that there. If you want to look that up later, there it's all there in First Corinthians two. Uh, that that the Holy Spirit uh, searches all things, just the deep things of God. And so uh, it, it talks about us, just the fact that the Holy Spirit's here as a teacher. And it, uh, at one point it says, let there not be many teachers among you. Uh, they shall receive stricter judgment. And then it talks about the Holy Spirit here being our teacher. And if you don't know how to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, God speaking to us in this manner, uh, I encourage you to begin to try to practice that. You might make some mistakes along the way, but that doesn't mean you're to give up and, and just throw everything away. You're here to try to be sensitive and to listen to the Spirit of God, the very Spirit of God that inspired man to write the Torah, the, the Haftorah, the Greek Hanashah, the whole uh, compact, the whole canon of the Scripture. The very one that inspired the Scriptures is living in us when you invite them in there. And He continues to teach us and reveal to us things in here. I, I you know, in the Messianic congregation, uh, we do learn Hebrew, and it's available to learn and to study, which I think is good. And, and a lot of the scriptures, uh, probably what, at least three fourths of the scriptures are written in Hebrew. And so sometimes when we look at some of the words and just some of the things that are there in the original Hebrew, it can really bring some things to our attention that we might not have saw otherwise, which is great. But we also need to not forget that the Holy Spirit is also our teacher. I think it was Smith Wigglesworth that used to say when he would read scripture and get understanding, he, he didn't rely, he wasn't a real wise man, so he didn't rely on the Hebrew or the Greek. He had to just totally put all his faith in the Holy Spirit to reveal to him things. Uh, because that was really the only book he even knew how to read. He, he couldn't read anything else. Uh, he just he wasn't, he, was only, he wasn't really an educated man. I don't even think he went to school a day in his life. Uh, I think he started working when he was like six years old or something, never went to school a day in his life, never learned how to read. And he, uh, when he learned how to read, he learned how to read the Bible. And that's kind of an amazing story when you read about the guy. Uh, as a young man, when I read about it, I thought, well, I'm going to try to do that. You know, uh, we don't live in that day and age, you know, that, you know, he didn't read magazines. I think they wrote some books by him. Some people had kind of criticized him. Well, you know, you say you only read the Bible, but then they've got books about you out there. But uh, supposedly the story was that's the only book he ever read in his whole life. It was just the Bible, not the only material he ever read. So uh, kind of inspiring. God sometimes places people in our planet in certain time frames to inspire us to be there. We, he's not alive today. But we can still kind of think about that particular individual God brought here. And that may not be us. It's not me. I've read many things. Uh, uh, and it's probably not you either. But God probably does have something distinct and unique that He may want you to do. Just like when we read a lot about Moses, God used him to show us a lot of things. And even today we're going to read some things. So hopefully you're there. And let's go ahead and get started. And before a portion this weekend and a lot of the synagogues is Kukat. Uh, means ordinance, statute, or law. And the book of Midbar of Numbers, chapter 19, verse 1, is where we'll begin. And yud heh they spoke to Moshe and to Aharon, saying, This is the ordinance of the Torah which yud heh has commanded. Speak to the Israel that they bring you a red heifer, a parahaduma, without blemish, in which there is no blemish, on which no yoke ever came. And you shall give her to Eleazar, uh, Hakohen the priest, that he may bring her forth outside the camp, and he shall kill her before his face. It goes on there to speak of uh, the, this red heifer that it begins. I told you to turn to Numbers. Not, I haven't even turned there yet. Uh, the book of Numbers. What did I tell you? Uh, just check that out. Good job. <laughs> Verse 5, then the heifer shall be burned in his sight. Its hide, its flesh, its blood, its mofal, or how you say that's done, it shall be burned completely, entirely. Uh, most of the time I teach, a lot of times if you study this, uh, some actually say, you may believe that some of the ancient sages, that even Solomon, 
in all his wisdom that he didn't really understand this, uh, this particular idea, this uh, red heifer idea. And many teachers will say that this para aguma, this red heifer points to Yeshua. And, and I do believe that. The Bible speaks up to us in the book of Hebrews and it says that Yeshua might sanctify the people through his own blood. He suffered outside the gate. Let us therefore uh, go forth to him outside the camp bearing his reproach. Many people believe that's talking about uh, in reference to kind of this red heifer issue. One of the things here, the, the red heifer, and again, it was to be burned entirely. It was to be taken outside the camp. And it was to be, uh, the ashes were to be gathered and to be used. And I'm going to bring a little bit different perspective to it today that I want you to just consider because sometimes things do have multiple meanings. Uh, that they don't just point to one thing, they can point to multiple things, teaching us several different things. So I believe the red heifer does point to Yeshua. This is one particular sacrifice that, that the color was important. Most of the sacrifices, they didn't have to be without blemish. But this particular sacrifice, it also had to be a certain color. And we don't really read any other sacrifice mentioned in the Torah that, that uh, had to be a specific color. Here was a very unique situation. It had to be brought outside the camp and had to be burned completely entirely. Here, through this uh, setting, everybody kind of had a job. One person was to take it outside the camp and, and to burn it. Once the person touched it, he became unclean. Later, another person came and they gathered the ashes to keep for certain purposes. They became unclean. So kind of the idea here in the Word of God, anyone that kind of came close to this red heifer, touched it in the process, they became unclean. So in a way, uh, I, I, uh, in a way, it's pointing to something else other than just Yeshua, in, or should I say in addition to Yeshua. Later, they were to take these ashes and they were to use them, I don't want to say a potion, but they kind of used them in a process or, or a potion, an ingredient with living water. And they were, it was almost like they would annoy the person if a person became unclean in contact with the dead. It was kind of what this whole process was used for. The uh, a person, whether they touched somebody in a, a war type situation, uh, someone died, they touch someone's dead bone. They actually touch someone's grave. Uh, it goes into specific details as far as if they became unclean. And so on the third day and on the seventh day, they were to go through a process that had to do with the ashes of this red heifer and running water, which basically speaks of living water. And unless they did it on the third day and on the seventh day, then they weren't declared to be ritually clean. So kind of an interesting idea that, that it brings out here. Uh, before I go on here, verse 5. Again, the heifer shall be burned in his sight. And here this word burn uh, kind of comes from the Hebrew word sarah, which can also mean poisonous fiery serpents, which we'll talk about in a little bit, another part of this Torah portion. I'm going to kind of maybe mention three parts of the Torah portion today. The red heifer, Moses hitting the rock, and the fiery serpent. They're all mixed here. They're all kind of tied together, I believe, and all really kind of pointing something to us, telling us something. And I just want to share with you what I believe, one of the things, one of the things they're sharing. They're, they're probably speaking multiple things, but this is one of the things I believe is just very important to us. The red heifer, this word, the word para means heifer. It can also mean fruitful. Fruit. Adam, this word aguma comes from the word Adam. Adam, first man, it means red. It means human being. So it could be red heifer. It can also, in a way, mean the fruit of humanity. Or we could even say what are what we produce as a flesh human. God bless you. What we produce as a flesh human being. This red heifer was to be burned its skin, which points to our feelings, sometimes our wants, our desires, its flesh, which can point to our strength, our 
our abilities, it's blood, which pointed to our very life, and it's dung, it's waste. And so this thing was to be removed from the camp, burned completely, and then its ashes were used. One of the things, uh, as I was praying about this, and I, I really believe this is uh, one of the means, I, I do believe it also points to Mashiach, but I also believe it points to the sin nature. Sometimes within Jewish culture it's called the, the, the evil inclination. And sometimes we call it the Adamic nature that, that uh, Adam, our wonderful forefather, first man, gave to all of us as a gift. Well, thank you, Adam. Uh, it passed on to all of us and we all receive it when we're born into this world. The flesh, carnal nature, the word again, Paran can mean the fruit, what comes forth. Adam can mean human being. Paul said there's nothing good in my flesh, nothing. Whoever touched the red heifer in the process became unclean. Whoever touched together the ashes became unclean. Want you to know that our flesh is very unclean. The Bible says flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. And sometimes I, 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 I focus on this, and I just many times I just feel the Spirit of God wanted me to focus on this. And because I, I don't hear it taught a lot of times, and, and, uh, and, and I know he's put it strong in my spirit to bring it out. As a born-again believer, we, we can say we believe in God, we can say we believe in the Bible, we can say we believe in Yeshua, the Torah, whatever we, we want to declare, which is wonderful. But there's something different than just saying I believe, and then also uh, doing something living a certain way because of that belief. The Bible tells us in the book of Yaakov or James that even the demons, they believe in God. They believe so strongly that they tremble, they shake, they believe. Hasatan, the great adversary, he believes. That doesn't mean really anything. But what is he doing? What are, they, what are the demons doing with that belief? And do they believe to the point that they are doing something about that belief. And there's many people in our world today that believe. And I'm glad they believe. But just because they believe, at times I question, is, is that enough? The Bible speak to, speaks to us, and specifically, that there's uh, even this Torah portion, I, I believe it points to us. In the New Covenant writings, it, it, it doesn't just, I mean, it, it's, it's there very clearly black and white. That, that we are to crucify the flesh, we're to die to the flesh, and we're to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. You know, some people, they, they bury their dead, which I think is biblical. Uh, sometimes caskets, coffins can be very expensive. Uh, you can get, get very cheap, pine pine box or whatever, you know. Uh, I know we've talked about family members, you know, when we die, and we just want it to be this way, and we don't want to spend you know, $10,000 on a casket that's going to be throw the dirt on it, we'll never see it again. Uh, you know, the person's dead, they, I, I, not that I don't think they matter. I mean, in a way, giving honor to the person, we understand that, so I'm not trying to say don't give honor to the dead. Even in this Torah portion, it's believed that uh, because they didn't really give honor to Mary or Moses' sister when she died, some believe that, that as a result, judgment came. Uh, not only that, Aharon, Moses' brother Aaron, dies in this Torah portion. And they mourned for him for 30 days. Uh, you know, I, I've had relatives that have died, and I've mourned for a little bit. I, I can't say, to be honest with you, that I've cried for 30 days straight, mourned. I mean, there is a natural mourning process uh, that we're going to miss that person, uh, what we respected that person, what they stood for, whatever the case may be. And we should go through a mourning process to help bring healing, especially to a loved one. Um, but I, I think at the same time, if we can go overboard if we're not careful, and, and we just need to keep a balance yeah. in, in that idea. The red heifer, para aduma, it could also point to the Adamic, carnal, sinful nature that has to be removed. It needs to be burned entirely, yeah. completely. Oh. Sometimes in life, there's more than just saying I'm a believer. I believe there's a lot of carnal believers out there. 
And God doesn't want us to be a carnal believer. The Bible speaks in the book of Galatians. It says this is the fruit of the Spirit. Maybe some of you have some of that memorized. Love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, and so forth. Before that, though, we don't usually memorize the before that where it says that the works of the flesh are these. Adultery, fornication, so forth. So for a lot of times we don't necessarily we have just sometimes we memorize the good sounding parts and then sometimes the negative sounding parts, but I don't you know, let me skip that. Sometimes I, I usually don't mark up my Bibles, but sometimes when people mark them up, they kind of underline or highlight the good stuff. You know, uh, years ago, uh, I was on a job site, and I used to go to a group that would always tell me, oh, yeah, we mark it up, color it up, you know. And so I would, I'd sit there, and I'd be underlining stuff, and this guy had come up to me, and he said, well, what are you doing crossing out all the stuff you don't like? And I kind of laughed, and I was like, no, no, I'm not doing that. I'm just kind of highlighting stuff so I can see the important parts, you know. But I, I thought, well... Isn't it all important, you know? Yeah. I, I began to kind of think even this by you know, the Torah scroll, uh, you know, we normally don't touch it with our fingers because the oil of our hands can mess up the paper, uh, so forth, and we don't mess so let me underline the, let me get the Torah scroll, let me underline that part, that's awesome. You know, man, the rest of it. So I mean that kind of mentality uh, at one point in my life, this is just me. I, I decided I'm not going to market my Bibles anymore. And I've heard this, and I just wanted to, you know, I don't necessarily preach it, but I've heard sometimes people say, well, if you see an old, messed up, worn out Bible, that means that's probably a really godly person. It might, but it might just mean that's just an untidy, messy, a messy person. So sometimes if they see me, I'm like, oh, look at his Bible, it's nice, I mean, there's no mark, uh, he must not use it much. But uh, different people treat things differently. So if I keep mine neatly, I keep them on a shelf. I keep, you know, I, I try to respect it and keep it. So I don't, I, you know, at, at times, yes, if we use it a lot, the pages get messed up, I understand that. But sometimes things are said, and it's not Bible, and sometimes people misinterpret them. I understand what people are saying when they say that. But at the same time, we have to, you know, uh, hopefully, you know, I've had people, new people, come in here. And I, I was laughing at my wife last night, and, uh, there was uh, sometimes grandma would say, oh, it's not Shabbat unless you shake hands, you know, and uh, tell everybody Shabbat Shalom. And I kind of laugh at him, you know, because we had people that have come in here, and, and he just says that, you know, just to encourage people, you know, it's, it's a day to, to greet people. But, you know, just because if I didn't say Shabbat Shalom or shake somebody's hand, it's still Shabbat regardless. Uh, but we've had new people come in, they, they really take that to heart. Oh, you know, unless I shake people's hands and say Shabbat, it's not really Shabbat. So uh, uh, sometimes things are said, and it's amazing sometimes how people hear them and how people understand them. So at times I just want to try to bring clarity. Uh, and most of you people I know, and I know you're probably not, you know, some of you don't have these thought patterns, but uh, sometimes maybe people will see a video later and they'll go, oh, okay, I didn't know that. I really thought this, you know. Anyway. Sorry, let me drop that little soapbox here. <laughs> okay, the Parah Aduma. One of the things, in addition to Mashiach, I believe this pointing to is the Adamic nature that needs to be burned completely, removed entirely. We were talking about the idea of the person being put in a casket. Some people get cremated. Uh, it's a little cheaper. Some people say it's not biblical. Uh, uh, just kind of is a, a personal matter between your conviction. There's not really a per se a commandment that says thou shalt not cremate. Uh, biblically, they bury uh, in respect for the person. Uh, I, that's kind of what I'm going to have done to me one day. And Yeshua buries, and that's going to happen. Uh, who knows what's going to what the future holds? Uh, you know, uh, the idea of a person having ashes of somebody there in their home to me is a little creepy. But uh, not for everybody. Sometimes it's respectful. Well, I'm not saying it's necessarily bad or evil. But, what, I'm saying all that to say this, the idea of those ashes, it, it, it is a picture of death. It, it's a reminder, it, it's what it remains. Our flesh, the Adamic nature, uh, all God wants to remain in that is just ashes. Whatever people became unclean because they touched death in some way, form, or fashion, they were to go through this process and have the ashes and running water. I think there's a key there as a spiritual born again believer, we desperately need those two things. 
We need to remind ourselves that we need to die daily to ashes, death. And we need that running water, the living power of the Holy Spirit, good. living and breathing in us and being empowered. So um, when I read the new covenant, and I, I and I believe it's important because sometimes in the Messianic congregation we just only read the Torah, the Hot Torah. I've been in place and I saw it last night, and it reminded me last night when I saw it years and years ago when I was in the place. And when they were reading the Torah or praying on the Torah, a lot of people stood up, yeah, yeah. And then when they were reading prayers for the Hot Torah, the Brit Hadashah, you know, it's, it's almost kind of like, well, we respect that part of the Word of God a lot more than the other part. Or it, it just kind of, this was when I was a new believer uh, in the Messianic movement, and it, it struck me. <clears throat> Before I had understanding, even now that I have understanding, though, I can, I'm thinking, what kind of a picture is that if you're going to stand up? Stand up for all the prayers. Stand up for all the words of God. So, uh, you know, and, and I understand, you know, everybody's different. Everybody's in a different place. And we should respect all the word of God straight across the board, Genesis to Revelation. A lot of times we come to a place like this because there are a lot of Christian churches that primarily preach out of the New Covenant. And uh, so sometimes we think, well, I'd sure like to know more about the old. So then we come here and we do hear a lot about the old. We go through the Torah portions. But we don't need to forget the New Testament because it's all tied together. And so as a Messianic believer in a Messianic congregation, don't forget the Gospels. Don't forget the new uh, the epistles. Don't, don't leave those in the dust. Because sometimes we come from different backgrounds. Uh, whether charismatic, Baptist, Seventh-day, whatever, some of those groups have some good points that maybe you learn. Don't forget some of those good things you learn just because you're in a group. Ah, you know, we, we don't speak in tongues here. This is Messianic group. You know, well, I, I don't see why not. There's a lot of spirit-filled Messianic groups out there. Some that aren't, some that are. Well, I'm in a Messianic group. We don't do the Holy Spirit thing. That's for the charismatic, Pentecostal, well, you know, uh, sometimes we get mindsets, you know, just be cautious, you know, because if, if it's in here, you know, if it's in here somewhere and, and, and it's for us and we can practice it, then, then by all means, let's not leave it out of the out of the program just because we've added some things that the Baptists don't have. Yeah, they don't have that and they don't have some of the Hebrew liturgy or the Torah. Well, that, that's fine. That, that's what they choose. But uh, let's not, you know, it's kind of like uh, one person may neglect a lot of things. And then another group, they neglect a lot of the other things. What does that mean once better? Well, this group, they neglect a lot of the Torah. This group, they neglect a lot of the Greek Hanashah. Well, they're both uh, lacking balance. Well, does that mean they're better because they're lacking that? Or they're better because they're lacking that? Or they're focusing on that? No, it just means they all just need to wake up. And they all just need to, to, to take the whole Word of God. The balance of, of everything in the Word of God. So... The red heifer does point to Yeshua. Normally I kind of teach in detail about that. But one of the things I just wanted to really focus on today and kind of tie together before I move forward here is that I also believe it points to the carnal, Adamic nature that has to be removed, that has to be completely burned up, that has to be completely and entirely uh, obliviated. And so I believe that's just a picture. Even the very meanings of the words, I believe, point to the Adamic nature, the, the fruit of our flesh. Uh, one of the first teachings in Hebrews 6 of Yeshua, he said, repentance from dead works. And that's part of what I believe he's talking about there, is turning from the dead works, and our flesh will only produce dead works. And we have to be moved by the Spirit of God. And I'm going to talk some more about that and tie that in. All right, let me go forward here a little bit. I am going to skip some things here and there in this Torah portion. Bear with me. Uh, I want you to read it later in its entirety. And it'll uh, uh, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal some things to you. Chapter 20 and verse 2. Chapter 20 and verse 2. And there was no water for the congregation. They gathered themselves against Moshe, against Aharon. And the people contended with Moshe, saying, Oh, that we had died when our brothers died before you came off. And why have you brought up the congregation of Adonai to this wilderness so that we and our cattle should die there? And why have you managed to come out of Egypt and bring us into this evil place? 
It is no place of seed or figs or vines or pomegranates. There's no water to drink. Moshe and Aharon went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. They fell upon their faces and the kabod of, of Yudhebah they appeared to them. The glory of the Lord appeared to them. And uh, I've mentioned this before. I just want to mention this again that the idea of uh, last week, the Torah portion, they fell on their faces before God several times, and here they are doing it again when they come to a difficult situation. And we should also follow that pattern when we come to a difficult situation, we should fall on our faces before God. Some believe the idea of falling down before Adonai will bring forth the glory of Adonai. One of the things that Hasatan, the adversary, wanted Messiah to do was to kneel down before him, to bow down before him. Why would he want that? Because it's saying something. Uh, when we do it in spirit, soul, and body, there's just something about that. The Hebrew word for bow down, shakah, is similar to a word contained in Hebrew for glory or splendor, sometimes used as uh, shakinah or shakinah, uh, which is actually on the building here that we're in. Kind of an interesting uh, idea that that uh, you know that word is there, a Hebrew word that speaks of God's presence, His, his manifest glory, His splendor. Uh, this shakinah, this uh, uh, glory, this splendor uh, can come at different times as God wills. But some believe that the idea of us humbling and bowing down before God helps sometimes to bring that glory. Sometimes we don't see that here in a block place like this. And, and I at times wish that we would see more people just bowing down before God. Sometimes we see the Israeli type Davidic dance, which I think is wonderful. Uh, the times, you know, depending on your background, sometimes people, you know, will lift their hands. Uh, I tell the story when I grew up in a little Baptist church as a boy. Uh, I, I just spent a few years as a boy in a Baptist church. I remember a particular church we were in. You didn't raise your hands. Uh, nobody raised their hands. And the only time anybody raised their hands was a really old lady. And I remember we kind of laughed at it because we thought, what is she doing? That looks crazy. You know, later my dad explained, well, some people, they do that to praise. And that, as, as a young boy, that's the only exposure I got to anybody expressing any kind of praise or thanksgiving or worship with just one old lady one time. And so other than that, nothing, you know, there was no real expression. We sang hymns, you know, very somberly. Oh, you know, and that was worship. And so somebody sang a special, nobody clapped. One deacon might say amen. Amen. That was it. <coughs> he didn't clap. Grab my drink. You didn't clap, and so you didn't express the idea. And so going back to this, at times I pray and I hope that we'll see more people expressing their worship to God, kneeling down before Him. And I'd love to see more of that, uh, that idea of expression. You know, we do express it here in certain ways, which is good, but I pray that we'll grow in that expression as a congregation and, and as an individual. I actually thought about it last night. We have mats back there in the back. And I thought, I think I'm going to grab one and bring it up here and kneel down. Not that I could do it without it, but maybe we'll have some up here just for that purpose. Uh, here, verse 7. Let, let me read verse 6 again here. And, and Moshe and Aharon went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. They fell on their faces and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. And you and Nabal, they spoke to Moshe, saying, Take the rod, gather the assembly, you and Aharon, your brother, speak to the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth its water, and you shall bring forth to them water out of this rock, and so you shall give the congregation and their animals drink. And Moshe took the rod before you and Nabal, they as he commanded him, and Moshe and Aharon gathered the congregation together before the rock. And he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, must we bring water for you by this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod, he struck the rod twice. And water came out plentifully, abundantly, and the congregation and their animals drank. That would be great if that was the end of the story, and everybody lived happily ever after, but a 
That's not. Verse 12. And through Ahab, they spoke to Moshe and Ahabon. He said this, Because you did not believe me to sanctify me in the eyes of B'nai Israel, therefore you shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. Mm. You know, uh, here, uh, a great blessing happened. They were thirsty. And they drank. Some good stuff. You ever tried this? This is called Tea's Tea. It has no sugar in it. It's just green tea. I don't know where it's made. Pretty awesome stuff. No, nope, it's just, just green tea and purified water. A lot, I was asking the young people last night, what was the problem with Moshe? What did he do wrong? I got a couple of different answers. He did a couple of things good. He did gather the people. He took his rod like God told him. He did bring water out of the rock like God told him. A lot of water, apparently. You know, but the cows, the cattle, they're all, the people, they're all drinking there together. Well, I'm just thinking if you had to drink water like that. I mean, right, right along there with all the animals, you're there just, I mean, I guess if you're thirsty enough, uh, you're going you're gonna to drink. You know? Sometimes we need to pray that God will make us thirsty. Because sometimes we're not thirsty enough for Him. I had mentioned that in Galatians, so I won't misquote it, I'm just going to go there. Uh, Galatians 5. And if you want to go there with me, you can. If you just want to listen, then I want you to listen. Galatians 5, and verse 19 is where I'm going to start. Galatians 5, 19, and this is what the Word says. Now the works of the flesh the manifestation of the flesh, what the flesh brings, we could even say the fruit, which can be the same word for heifer, of the flesh of humanity, which can be the same word as Adam, speaking really to the red heifer, are evident. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contention, jealousy, outburst of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. <clears throat> Here, Paul has said similar things to this. And he's saying those that allow their flesh to do what it wants, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. I don't care who they are. I don't care how good looking they are, how spiritual they are. I don't care if they do miracles. You know, he actually said that, that there will be some that will come in that day and say, didn't we do these things in your name? Uh, aren't, we, uh, aren't we on your good side? We cast out demons and uh, we might have spoke with tongues a time or two. And he'll say, no, you, you really think that I don't really know you. You, you, in a way, he's probably going to say, you didn't sanctify me in your life. You didn't crucify the flesh and walk after the Spirit. Yeah, but I believe in Messiah. That's wonderful. And we all need to believe in Messiah. But that's the first step. And you didn't take it beyond that. One of the things that God spoke to Moses was this. Verse 12. Because you did not believe me to sanctify me, in the eyes of Israel. Now we all may believe in God here today. I believe we do. But do we believe in Him enough to sanctify Him in our lives? To set Him apart in a way that He's supposed to be set? Well, I believe Moses messed up because he, 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 because he called them bad names. Some may say, well, I believe Moses messed up because uh, uh, he, he was angry or her because he hit the rock, or because he hit the rock twice, or... <clears throat> you know, maybe that's all part of it. And he pointed people to himself, not to Adonai. When he said, let it, some say, the way he spoke, he said, let us, speaking of him and Aaron, let us, uh, shall we bring water out of this rock? Some people believe he was speaking of him and Aaron. We read in Galatians a lot of different things here. Manifestations of the flesh. 
I remember I was in one Bible study many, many years ago when I had read a lot of those names. Uh, contentions, outbursts of wrath. Uh, one young man that was there, he was saying, well, that sounds like a bunch of heavy metal, the names of he a bunch of heavy metal groups. Uh, uh, you know, and I was thinking, well, maybe a few of them do, I guess, uh, depending, on, depending on what translation you have. Um, Moshe had a manifestation of the flesh here. No matter how it's displayed, and kind of like what Paul said here in Galatians 5, then he, he makes the list, and then he says, and anything like this. And so, I'll just say this, in my studies, one of the things, it can be multiple things, but one of the things I believe we're seeing here is Moshe being this leader, and he just yields to the flesh. And this was all manifestations of the flesh. His anger, him calling them out, this rebels, him hitting the rock, uh, uh, it was just all part of this flesh coming out uh, and being displayed. He believed in God. He went through the process, but he didn't believe enough to set God apart in his life and to stay holy unto God in this particular situation. God still blessed with a lot of water. The people had a need. There are people today, preachers, the Bible actually speaks of it. In many places, the Messiah spoke of it that there will be deceivers. There will be false signs and wonders. We even, I had mentioned it earlier, people in that day will say, hey, we did many wonderful, miraculous things. And he says, I didn't know you. They were believers, yeah. Probably some of them were. I can think of a multiple different people, uh, however we want to label them, healing evangelists, people that you see on TV. A lot of people got healed. People got delivered and healed. But the preachers were in error because they weren't pointing people to God. They were kind of pointing people to themselves. And uh, they were, and some of them you could see very vividly, they weren't crucifying the flesh. They were living after the flesh. Uh, my girls years ago, and uh, you know who Miley Cyrus is, I think her real name was Destiny Cyrus, and the daughter of Ray Cyrus, supposedly used to, she was a Christian. And she used to be on Disney Channel, and her, her show was called Hannah Montana. And I, I've watched enough episodes of it, you know, when my kids were younger. And comedy, good, plain comedy. Some of them were hilarious. And now she's gone way to the side of the flesh, and she's become famous for lewdness, lasciviousness, just, just all kind of wicked things. I, I kind of think about, you know, my daughter saw her from one stage to the other. And the other day, just in jest, one of my, my daughters, you know, don't listen to her music, but you know, a long, long time ago, she had a song out that was called, I, I don't even know what the name of it was, and if you have kids, you might know, you know, The Best of Both Worlds or something, where the idea was, The Best of Both Worlds, you know, I don't, you know the idea was almost, you know, and I began to think about that, and I think, you know, what kind of a message is that saying? You know, I, I want the best of both worlds. You know, I want to go to heaven, yes. but I want to I, I want to be able to live how I want here and have the fun I want and just enjoy my fleshly desires and pleasures. And so I, I thought there's no such thing necessarily as the best of both worlds. You've got to choose one or the other. That's right. You've got to choose this world or the next. It's not like, God, oh, I choose the next. But I want to have a lot of fun in here and just, just party it up. And, and, you know, you've got to choose God or the world. You've got to choose to serve man or to serve God. Moshe was here as a lesson for all of us. A strong lesson. That he crossed the line. At one point, Miriam crossed the line. Moses' sister, she was speaking some things against him and she got leprosy. They prayed, she was healed, but she still had to kind of be quarantined for about a week, set aside before she could come back into the camp. Moshe here is spoken to, him and Aaron both, they, they will not enter the promised land. One of the things I believe God is speaking to us today is that flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. If we think we're a believer and we're going to live after the flesh and do what we want, but we're still going to enter into those wonderful heavenly Jerusalem, I believe we have another thing coming. God has given us freedom, and even as we just say it today, I believe we're free in Mashiach. It even says it right here, 
uh, in my translation, and, and the very sometimes they put little phrases that helps you know what they're talking about. <coughs> At the beginning of chapter five, mine says Christian liberty, and um, and so the idea that we're free, yes, the Messiah, we're set free, we're forgiven, but that doesn't mean we just live however we just feel like it. And so. Here, Moses, we see, I believe, an example. You can't just do anything you want. Sometimes God will have mercy. Sometimes God will meet your needs. Sometimes God will work a miracle. But that didn't mean that, that everything was still good in the heart and in the life of Moshe and Aharon at this time. Sometimes we see people working miracles on TV. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that person has their heart right and they're living right with God. And we have to be cautious. They may be a believer. By all means, they may believe, but, but that doesn't mean that they're living right. Yeah. And so we may be a believer, but that doesn't mean we're living right. And I believe we need to do both. We need to believe and we need to live right. Notice how he words that again here in this translation, chapter 20, verse 12. And now when I spoke to Moshe and Ahamon, because you did not believe me to sanctify me, in the eyes of Bnei Israel, therefore you will not bring the congregation into the land. They believed him, but they did not believe him to sanctify him. So hopefully your belief today isn't just a belief on the level of a demon, but your belief is a, a belief that says, I believe, and because I believe, I'm going to sanctify myself. I used to work with a believer, uh, a Baptist guy, and he would always say, I'm I don't remember how he worded it, but he would say something like, I'm saved, sanctified, and filled with the Spirit, or something, you know. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, filled with the, and that's, and filled with the Holy Ghost, you know. And, and he would say, I'm saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost, is kind of what he would say. Sometimes, you know, we may not say that, but hopefully they knew the meaning of what that meant. Not just saved, forgiven, I believe, but the idea of sanctified, set apart for God, uh, empowered by His Holy Spirit. It's all there together of what we should be doing with God. They bought for the water. People were thirsty. They got a drink. They complained a lot. And a lot of judgment took place. The very last part here, we're kind of wrap things up. Um, in 21, it talks about the people complaining again. You know, sometimes things can get rough. Moses' sister died. And then Moses' brother dies. Then all the people began to speak against him. Now we may think, well, that's a, a, a man of God. That's a woman of God. That's a person called of God. I bet you everything's wonderful in their life. Uh, you better think again. Uh, I'm not saying that they're evil. But I'm saying they have their troubles just like anybody else. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Hadn't they learned better by now? Uh, I guess not. Uh, maybe this was different people. But, you know, we see this pattern. In verse chapter 21, verse 5. Numbers 21, verse 5. The people spoke against Elohim and against Moshe. Why have you brought us up out of the land of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no bread. There's not any water. Our soul hates this light bread. Talking about the man. I mean, they were getting ugly. And you they bought. They sent fiery servants among the people. And they bit the people. And many people of Israel died. The people came to Moshe and said, Well, we have sinned. For we have spoken against Adonai and against you. Negative, unbelieving words are like bites from a poisonous snake. Verse 21, they said, pray. Or before that, they said, pray that God may take away these servants. And Moses prayed. 21, verse 8, and Adonai spoke to Moshe, make a fiery serpent, set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone that is bitten when he looks upon it, he shall live. And so Moshe did it. And the people looked upon him, and they were healed. The serpent provided healing for those who looked upon him. The idea that the poison, this snake, uh, this bird, it's like it would bite them and they would burn. And again, this word is equivalent to the word where it talked about the red heifer was to be burned. Whether our flesh is manifesting and hitting things like a rock, are speaking out things in anger, ugliness. We have to guard ourselves against the 
Adamic nature. Yeah. You know, I, I think of a, what they call that, a bull in a china shop. Uh, that's kind of the way the old Adamic nature is. We have to keep it out of the china shop. We have to keep it at bay. We have to keep it in its place through the power of the Holy Spirit. God wants us to be believers, but He wants us to be believers that sanctify God in our lives. Believers that know how to crucify the flesh, that know how to walk after the power of the Holy Spirit. And so there's more than just saying, I believe. That is where it starts. And we all have to start somewhere. But we have to go beyond that. I, I look at our culture, in our world today, and again I see tons of people that say they believe. But I do at times question, I see fruit, I see things that I wonder, that's not the Spirit of God, that's flesh. Oh, but I'm free and I'm saved. Uh, yeah, you're free and you're saved, all right, but you need, to, you need to get sanctified, you need to set yourself apart for God. He called you for greater things than this. Oh, I'm free. I, I, I'm the Messiah. Yeah, you are. But, but you need to wake up. And so, uh, I pray that you won't follow the example that sometimes our world has. Sometimes these, there's churches that are full of people because they're preaching and tickling people's ears, telling them that you can have the best of both worlds. Maybe singing that old Bible, whatever, Hannah Montana song. You can have the best of both worlds. And I'm saying, no, you can't. We need to make a choice. We need to die to ourselves, to this world, and live humbly before our God and look forward to the next world. The Bible says, interesting story, I'm going to close with this. If you want to turn there later and look at this, uh, <coughs> in 2 Kings, Chapter 18, 2 Kings. If you're there, say amen. amen. If you're not, then uh, say oh my. Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> amen. All right, 2 Kings. Uh, let me find it here. I'm trying to look for something else to do at the same time. Uh, later in this tour, of course, there are some other things that happen, uh, some battles, some war, but this, this is kind of the main things I wanted to just kind of bring out a couple of things here. Uh, okay, here we go. You're there, Second Kings 18? Okay, just making sure. Thank you. Good job. Can somebody read for me? It's out of uh, verse 4. Different religions that come in here 
Oh my gosh, I've got to lead on. You know, sometimes we, if you're not careful, we think we worship this. No, you know, I, I'm holy now. You know, that, that's great, you know. And I was telling the young people last night, uh, last Friday night when I came here, I didn't have my seat seats on or my kiba or a tie. Last night I had my kiba and my tie and my seat seat. Regardless of how you saw me those two Fridays, physically, what was more important was what's in here. That's right. Because uh, we were talking about judging according to the appearance and kind of where our heart is at. And so sometimes uh, we may see a person, they look really, you know, Messiah dealt with in his day. Well, you look really holy. You've got big old seat seats. <laughs> <laughs> and that sometimes they can purposely make their seat seat bigger or their, their prayer box big and pray big prayers for show. And, and of course, Messiah put them in their place. So that, that's not what it's about. Yeah, but we want the best of both worlds. We, we want the good seats in the house. You know, we want people to look at us and think, wow, that, that's a holy person. <laughs> but uh, I want you to know that none of us are holy outside of the Messiah. We're not. We never were and we never will be outside of Him. No matter how hard we work, no matter how much holy clothing we put on outside of Him, we're nothing. Without Him, we'll bear no fruit. I don't care how much Torah we know or Hebrew, which are both great, but outside of Messiah, we're still nothing. Yeah, but I know Hebrew now. That's great. Yeah, but I know this now. That's great, too. But you still need Messiah. Yeah, but I'm practicing Torah and I need kosher now. That's great, but you still need Messiah. Amen. <laughs> and you need to sanctify yourself. Not just have a, a, a living set apart. So, I close with that. Uh, just... Uh, I encourage you to read through there. There's a lot of other things. The idea of the red heifer, I believe, could point to the adaptive nature, which Moshe displayed, which the people of Israel displayed, which we know gets us into a whole bunch of trouble. Galatians says those that follow after the works of the flesh will not inherit the kingdom of God. Point blank. And so uh, let's just take that, believe it, and let's stay away from that kind of stuff. And if we can't do it in and of ourselves, we need the power of the Holy Spirit. That's kind of what that process, the ashes, the running water, I believe that's part of what it's pointing to. It's pointing to death of Messiah, uh, death of ourselves. We die with Him, and then we breathe in the living water, and then we go forward from there. And we don't go back and wallow in the ashes. Uh, we don't go back. It has to be complete on the third day and on the seventh day. Both the number three and seven speak of completeness. And so it had to be complete. And so the concept uh, of the, the, the red heifer had to be completely burned. Well, I'm going to keep this one hair out because it's such a pretty color red. I, I just want to keep it as a souvenir. You know, sometimes we may think, oh, I guess you get away with a little bit, you know, just a little bit of fleshly pleasure. Flesh. Mm -hmm. Just a little bit, you know, and I'll get forgiven and then we'll go on. Just be careful, because sometimes that little bit may cost you a whole lot. Yeah. Oh, but I just don't know if I can control myself. Well, you probably can, but you need God's help and the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and if you don't think you can, you begin to ask your help for brothers and sisters. Get into the Word of God. Uh, you don't you fall on your face as Moshe and Aaron did so many times and ask for his help. He's there for you. He's there for you. And so uh, when we mess up, we're to pray and get it right and get back up and keep going. Well, let's close out. Uh, time has gone away as usual. Uh, before I close, uh, someone had left this last week uh, a Magin Dadi bookmarker. Uh, I don't know what they uh, is this somebody that made it here last week? Is that look? No, maybe it's from Friday night. Okay, I just want to make sure there's nobody's around. I'll kind of put it. And if you ever do lose something, let us know. We kind of try to keep it in the room together. And at times people will leave things or lose things, so we can try to keep them and give them back to their rightful owners. So, okay, I'm going to put it in the room. Then. I don't, nobody's claiming it. If you need to look closer at the service, you can. Uh, you know, I, I don't know what it is, but uh, anyway, some kind of little, uh, first I thought it was a hair clip, but I think it's actually just a bookmarker, kind of a, 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 a real nice bookmarker there. All right, let's go ahead and stand. Let's get ready to close out for today.
Dear Heavenly Father, we do today receive your blessings that your word speaks of in the book of Bamidbar, chapter 6. And we ask you that you will help us to live after the Spirit of God. Help us to far turn from the works of darkness and to turn from the works of the flesh. And Lord, help us to know what it means to be set apart for you. Lord, to believe in you and to be set apart for you. Help us to do, Lord, those things that please you. Those things that you're calling us to. And help us not to fear what man says. Help us, Lord, not to try to please the flesh, but to please you. And to obey you, Lord, and, and uh, everything you tell us to do, even if it looks foolish, even if you're telling us to go speak to a rock. Help us to do it. Lord, even though it may look dumb, it may be humiliating. It, it, it may just not be quite what we think. We're going to do it our way, not God's way. Lord, help us to be cautious of that. Help us to know your way and do things your way. We do pray. And Lord, we do thank you. Protect us as we travel and go our way. Bless us with your presence. And we do receive your blessing. As Adonai said to Moshe, speak to Aaron and his sons. Tell them, this is how you are to bless the people of Israel. Bye.